like to welcome you to the place. This is the place for intellectual, spiritual, and scriptural honesty, whatever that means. I'm not convinced that we can adequately wrestle with the meaning of terms unless we've taken the time to investigate uh, both externally and internally. And so with that said, uh, honey, I think that we have some wonderful guests tonight. We have Adam Gadamoski, and also we have uh, Christopher Mounty. And um, I'm looking forward to having a wonderful discussion tonight with both of them. And they have the amazing ability to uh, uh, really artic articulate a good argument. And uh, I would like to bring both of them up right now, but uh, before I do, why don't you say something that's so, so true. You're awesome looking tonight, well, by the way. I really appreciate that. Um, it is great to have uh, people that have differing uh, worldviews, um, but yet I bet before the night's over, we can all find a lot of common denominators. Um, so we start out as people not knowing a lot about each other, and by the end of the night, our goal is to be friends and uh, learn much more about each other and possibly say, hey, I've learned something tonight. And that's that's my goal. I really want to learn something from both of these guys. And as usual, I learned so much from you. Well, thank you. And uh, likewise, I mean, you're the one who is the teacher. <laughs> uh, without uh, hesitation, we are going to bring our guest on Adam, uh, how are you doing tonight? Doing well. How about yourself? Uh, doing well. Uh, doing well. Uh, can you hear us adequately? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good deal. Uh, I, I think it was uh, on a Facebook discussion. I think you were talking with uh, Robert Green. Ingersoll, if I'm not mistaken. I, I think that's the first time that I talked with you actually on Facebook. Uh, am I mistaken? I think that's the name, yeah. Yeah. And I, I was impressed with your, uh, some, some of your points. I was really impressed with your uh, respect that is in the conversation. Not many people know how to show a lot of respect. And one of the things that we try to encourage here at the place is giving people lots and lots and lots of respect. And so uh, I would like for you to just, you know, tell people who you are and, and, and what you like to do. That is, uh, you are a theist, is that correct? Yes, Christian theist. Okay, and um, when, when you say Christian, I'm sorry. When, when you say Christian theist, what does that exactly mean? Um, I am a, uh, I, I believe in, uh, you know, the traditional theistic God, but additionally on top of that, I um, believe in the Christian God. Um, so Trinitarian uh, scripture is authoritative for theology. It has the best answers for what we, for the questions that we have concerning God. Now, when you, when you say that Christianity has the best answers, what... What, what do you mean by the term Christianity in, in particular? Um, specifically, it would be, I would say, Scripture um, as the primary understanding, of, you know, uh, revelation concerning God. Um, but when it comes to uh, just the, the tradition of Christianity itself, there's been um, further speculation and questions that uh, Scripture doesn't at least directly answer. So... Um, there is wiggle room for that, um, uh, for things that aren't specifically answered in Scripture. Uh, uh, so there's room for disagreement there. But it would come specifically to the New Testament um, revelation of uh, Jesus as God on earth. So you're one who advocates that Jesus is very God, very human, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. I also want to introduce into the program uh, Christopher Maute. He's a wonderful person. He is an atheist and a bass player, and that's important to us. And so, welcome, oh, Christopher. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. How are you doing tonight? Uh, doing well. Uh, did you get everything hooked up to where you can actually uh, play a few riffs for us tonight? No, actually, uh, not. I wasn't able to. I um, I have a lot of computers set up so that I can uh, have one available, uh, so I can do some research if I needed to, as well as one for the Skype. 
a little bit cramped right now, so unfortunately I won't be able to shred for you tonight. I, I understand. Uh, I so enjoyed listening to uh, what you had on YouTube, and I would advise uh, or invite people uh, who are listening tonight simply to go to your YouTube site and listen to some wonderful music. You're, you're very, very talented. And how long have you been playing the bass? Um, oh, since I was uh, about 13, 12, 13, and I'm 41 now, so a while, a long while. Right. What, what uh, you told me, I think it was last night, that you really liked uh, Wooten and his style. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. Victor Wooten and uh, my, my primary slap influence on bass is uh, Larry Graham, the bass player for Sly and the Family Stone. Wow. He's the guy who he invented the slap pop technique, so he hands down is one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. So you know, I find myself in a little bit of a conundrum. I'm, you know, an atheist uh, person trying to uh, play a style that came out of the church, which is you know funk, which came from gospel, which you know absolutely came out of the church. So I'm an atheist trying to perfect a style that uh, that is very church derivative. So you know, it's a bit of a paradox and ironic, but uh, I strive for it nonetheless. I enjoyed listening to the one particular song. Uh, you also do singing, and, uh, yeah. and, and you did some riffs during uh, that particular song. I, I thought that was very, very good. It, it was just a rough recording. However, it, uh, it, really, uh, it, it really was done well. Thank you very much. I appreciate your kind words. Uh, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to try to take it step by step, and I'm going to talk with both of you guys and I, I would like to ask a curiosity question have you ever been a theist Christopher uh, I was raised Roman Catholic Roman Catholic uh, but were you actually a theist um, I very much believed in um, the faith that I was raised uh, I was an altar boy I went through several of the sacraments all the way up to confirmation um, and uh, I very much believed it up to a point. I mean, I think that George Carlin has a, uh, has a very popular line that says, I was raised Catholic until I reached the age of reason. And uh, I wish that were the case. I wish, I wish that I, you know, I, to this day, I don't think that I've reached the age of reason. Uh, but um, there did come a point of doubt. So I, I believe that at some point I had a relationship with God. I prayed. I, you know... Um, I went through the rituals. Um, uh, I, I thought that, as as I understood, a relationship with God was is what I had. That's 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 fascinating. I think that a lot of people are raised in church, and they they do believe. And I, I think that Richard Dawkins has a lot to say concerning that. He he compares it to this gene pool, and then he talks about this meme pool. And so, if you're raised in mm -hmm. India, you know you have certain beliefs, and if you're raised in America, especially in the South, you know, you might have a certain consideration. And I think that may have a lot to do with why we uh, do believe something uh, to be true. However, I, I think there are some arguments that would lean the other way. I want to bring Adam back into the discussion because I'm curious as to what he perceives to be uh, scripture. Adam, uh, we were talking about scripture and, and in particular, because I think that you hold to the Bible as your your text. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, why would you hold to the Bible as opposed to any other book as far as your text that is of theology? Uh, that's a complicated question. Um, I've, done, I've done studying of the Quran, for instance, and um, not to at all bash or, uh, any other religion or anything like that, but I found some of the claims... Um, concerning the Quran to not really jive with what I understood to be true. Um, Great, and now I did grow up, and um, I, I did grow up a Baptist. I'm not a Baptist anymore, but I grew up uh, as a Christian. Uh, so when we're having tremendous feedback but, problems um, here in the studio, it, let, let, uh, let me stop the conversation just for a moment. If we can turn the monitor down on me completely, that's fine with me. Uh, uh, Okay, uh, we are having a problem. We may have to stop just for a moment, but I want to get into this. Uh, uh, can you hear me? 
Yes. Okay. Uh, you and, and, and forgive me if I stop you from time to time, but I think that a lot of us are curious because uh, Christopher is claiming I, I was raised, namely, a Catholic. And then you brought up the idea of being somewhat a Baptist. And, and mm -hmm. in particular, what kind of Baptist? I, I think the Southern Baptists are much different than the Northern Baptists because the Northern Baptists actually argued uh, for uh, slavery, things of that nature. W were you Southern Baptist or Northern Baptist or what kind of Baptist? I was actually, um, well, an independent fundamental Baptist. Very, very, very fundamentalist. Um, in fact, my, my dad was a pastor. Um, so I grew up um, not as bad as, say, like someone like the Westboro group. Um, but while we would never do something like that in some of the churches I had attended, um, not my dad's at all, obviously, um, there were some churches that I attended that would be okay with that, that, that type of, you know, um, sort of irrational type of hatred and stuff. Um, so actually that kind of caused me to question my own faith my freshman year in uh, college. So for there, there was about... I'd say maybe about a year or so that I was questioning my own faith, questioning the existence of God. That coupled with quite a few other personal problems happening in my life and stuff. Um, but I ended up, after doing a little bit of research, coming back to Christianity fully. And so there was a time in which uh, your faith was completely in question, if I'm not misunderstanding what you're saying. Is that correct? Yes, very much in question. Uh, when it was in question, did you ask questions like, why did I get saved, or why did I perceive that Jesus needed to die for me? Uh, did you ask questions like that, or what kind of questions? Not so much those questions. The questions, I think, um, were, I guess, more typical that a lot of my friends grew up, that I grew up with, you know, who became atheists, their, their sort of questions, the questions sort of like, well, if God exists, why is there suffering? Um, why would it, God send people to eternal torment? That sort of thing. Um, you know, all those types of questions. Um, and coupled that with, you know, like my own personal struggles and suffering. And I'm like, well, I want to get rid of these problems in my life. Why doesn't God get rid of them for me? So uh, those types of things just kept happening. So I would, you know, have nights of, being very upset with God, um, praying, and then wondering, am I even praying to anybody? Is it just, you know, hitting the ceiling? What, what's happening? So that, that was a very tough year of my life. Right. Uh, Christopher, did you go through any of what Adam is talking about? Um, the doubting? Right. You know, the doubting, the praying, or whatever, just trying to sort um, it all out. Yeah, I think that when I was either a junior or senior in high school, um, I bought myself um, what at the time was called a one-year Bible, where it, was, it broke the Bible up into 365 sections, where each day's reading was a portion of the, New Te the Old Testament, a portion of the Old Testament, and I think a psalm. And I read it, and um, uh, instead of instilling wonder in me and understanding it kind of freaked me out because at the time I was a um, I was a teenager and um, you know the idea that um, you know Christ said that lusting after a woman in your heart is as bad as committing adultery in the mind of a hormone infested teenager at the time I mean that that made me neurotic almost uh, so I, I, after I got done reading that for the year, I kind of distanced myself away from um, Christianity and kind of did some searching in um, more new age type um, mysticism, I guess you would call it. And I found that completely unsatisfactory as well. Uh, Adam, uh, what brought you back to the faith, if I can call it faith? Um, yes, definitely faith. Um, I would say it, it happened gradually, and the first thing that happened to me was a very personal um, sort of miraculous experience, followed by another one that happened about a year later, maybe two years later. Um, and then the more I, like after those two experiences, 
um, or experiences, I mean, um, I, I just kind of, I met up with a, a really strong Christian who uh, to this day is a good friend of mine, um, and just start researching, you know, kind of forgetting all the, the theology I had learned from my childhood and stuff, and kind of starting afresh and listening to all sorts of different theologians, philosophers of all stripes, and trying to see and understand what fit and what made the most sense. Um, and the more I read and studied, the more it made sense, and the more it seemed like, okay, God's not the sort of, you know, you know, white-haired man in the sky, you know, throwing lightning bolts at people he hates and stuff. You know, I, I got away from that and just started understanding more about what um, the New Testament taught about God. Uh, if I were to ask you some questions concerning the Old Testament, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. wondering how you would react. For instance, if I asked you about Elisha walking down the road one day and 42 children uh, calling him Baldy and Elisha mm -hmm. turning to these children, however they, old they are, you know, it's, in, in a sense it's superfluous as to whether you know, they are uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, or 30 years old. But he curses the children. And not only does he curse the children, but um, but according to the uh, meta language that we see in English, we see that God sends two she bears to maul these same children, forty-two of them, to death. Yeah. Do you think that is moral in any sense? I think that I think that sounds horrible, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I, you know, th that's one of the next things I, I'm. Uh, Currently, I'm finishing up studying about hell and uh, coming to my understanding of that. Pretty much complete with it now. Um, so the next thing I want to look at fully is the Old Testament. And there are quite a few problem passages like that. And, I mean, I think uh, it's really just wrong for some Christians to kind of try to rationalize that because on the face of it, it sounds horrible. Um, right. That really doesn't sound like something that's good. Um, so it's something that I thought to study. One problem, I think, is that the uh, Hebrew in the Old Testament, uh, the, the language is very poetic. So um, not that that sounds like very nice poetry, but um, in the sense that like it can be taken as literally as something like the New Testament Greek. So it's, it's, it's a thing that I'm w wanting to study further and more and everything. Right. So when, when, when you look at the Old Testament, to you, would you think that it has any value? If so, what? Well, I would say it definitely does have value because um, part of the problem in this complicated look at how we look at the Old Testament is that if you look at Jesus and if you look at you know Paul and James and others and Peter, they quote the Old Testament very much as authoritative. And um, so... I mean, obviously, I would say something to the effect of, I don't think that Jesus, I mean, look at him historically and, you know, in the Gospels, I don't think he's advocating, like, you know, sending out bears to small little children or anything like that. Um, but at least a lot of the theology there is more, in the Old Testament, is completed by the New Testament. Um, it, it's, I guess, kind of the other side of the coin. if that makes sense. Do, do you think that Jesus is actually quoting the text itself? Or do you think that he is taking the oral transmissions of the text? Because please understand that, you know, there was the oral Torah and then the written Torah, uh, two different things. Yes. And so the Jews yeah. had a practice of, uh, it was called a creative process, uh, uh, process. And what they would do, they had a consonantal text, and the writing system is actually called an abjad. And in other words, it means that it's not vowel pointed. It's been pointed over four different times. All pointing systems are diametrically opposed to each other. And so if one were to say, well, I, I want to understand the text and all of these pointing systems of this, this Old Testament writing system, they're all different. How could anyone intelligently understand any of it if it is pointed? Um. In, in, in so many different ways, because uh, in, in the days of Jesus, uh, th this was a very much a debate because revocalization was a common practice. In fact, none of what Jesus said can be found in the Old Testament. That is, if we look at it in an accuracy-based model. 
Uh, I would say that, um, at least according to what the New Testament um, gospel authors and uh, Paul himself quotes as far as the Old Testament is concerned, they do use most of the time, they do use what's called the Septuagint. Um, and what that is, is it's a Greek translation of the uh, Hebrew Old Testament. But, um, but the, the, the translation, uh, supposed translation of the Septuagint has changed much in every way. It, it reminds me of the evolution of mythology in a sense, because when we look at the makings, it's, it's like the Textus Receptus, number one, number two, and number three, it evolved. And, and if we look at it carefully, we can see that it is evolving, and we can see that it does not come from the text itself, but the oral transmission of the text, not one and the same, because if you, if, for instance, for the sake of argument, if you attempt to back translate uh, the Septuagint back into First and Second Temple Hebrew in the Aramaic, which comprises the majority of what we call the Old Testament, it's not possible no. to do legitimately. And so we do not have uh, the capabilities of being able to put those kinds of templates together because it's not rational or feasible. So if back translating isn't possible, and I haven't found anyone who has been able to accomplish that, and I, I can appreciate one saying, you know, we can read the Septuagint. And, uh, to a certain extent, that is true, but I, I, w I would think that uh, less than 10% of the Septuagint is even understood at this point in time. What say you? Um, I, I would say, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely have to look it up more um, and study this further because yeah, my understanding is that, um, for instance, when Jesus, uh, you know, in, I think it's Matthew, I'm not sure, takes a scroll and reads from uh, Isaiah, I think. Um, he's, you know, reading it from a scroll rather than um, reciting orally. Um, and I would say that, I, like, like I said, I, I've barely even begun doing that yet. I'm still finishing up my um, studies on hell. But it's definitely going to be something very interesting to look at. Because I, I think you mentioned me to me that dimension for um, through Facebook, um, but something I've never heard of before. Before that, right? You know, th there is a difference between reading and rendering, and I would argue mm -hmm. that Jesus was rendering, in a sense, abstract art. In other words, when you look oh. at a consonantal text, it's not true that you're looking at something that really demonstrates the intent of any author, because as okay. all linguists agree, without vowels. Uh, language makes no sense. You, you have to have these phonemes constructed and uh, as such that would come together and, and, and make some kind of sense. And this is the reason that we've had this, this, this writing system called an object, Jod, pointed so many times throughout history. And, and please understand uh -huh. that the Jews do not hold to the same pointing system as, as the Protestants and the Catholics. And so, you know, this is not a, a small debate here. This is a huge debate. And in fact, oh, yeah, the definitely. Jews do not even look at their text as an accuracy-based model. They look at it simply as abstract art because it was written that way to keep away from liability, if you know what I'm saying. In other words, if you are a culture of people and you have 12 tribes and you want to keep away from liability and you're on killing sprees, uh, like these people were going from place to place, killing the women, the children, and, and the infants, and all of their animals. You know, you have a liability issue there. And in order to allow for growth, in a sense, uh, and, and the furtherment of, of, of more rational thinking and rethinking what you're doing, uh, they did this, uh, uh, in a sense, to keep from being liable in many, many cases to establish, you know, properties, et cetera. And so, I, I don't know. I just wanted to explore your thoughts for a moment, and that's not the only thing about the Old Testament that troubles me. We, we, we do have a lack of what I call indexical and didactic elements, which means that we really don't have the non-linguistic elements that are essential in determining the meaning of any of the text. Uh, and I've never found anyone who has even uh, developed a method of actually retrieving those lost elements. Yeah, that's actually, um, that, that brings up a good point, because that really kind of helps us understand that we, we really can't, um, we've got to interpret the Old Testament through the eyes of the New. Okay, but, um, but, but isn't that an interpolation? That's, that's a major assumption, isn't it? Is that not? 
Um, well, it, it's an assumption. It's a presupposition for for Christian. I'm sorry, I'm speaking as a Christian. Um, that if I'm to look at theology from, I, I shouldn't derive theology as a Christian simply from certain Old Testament passages, while completely ignoring the New Testament. Um, I would say that that's not wise at all. You know, the, the, and 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 I, I want to get Christopher back into this. Uh, context of, of, of talking and wrestling with this Old Testament idea. Uh, what what do you have to say, Chris, uh, Christopher? Well, I'm going to have to admit that uh, I'm not much of a Bible scholar. So, um, uh, as far as the details of Old Testament versus New Testament, it sounds like Adam is saying that um, uh, the uh, when Jesus was speaking, he was speaking about the Old Testament um, as as if it were. Um, predicted in the Old Testament, uh, the things that were done in the New Testament. Am I, am I in general getting that correct? I, I didn't hear some of that. I'm sorry, could you speak again? Okay. Um, can you hear me okay right now? Yeah, I can hear you now. It's just kind of echoing okay. a little bit. I hear you. Um, I was uh, saying, I'm not much of a, bi uh, a biblical scholar, but it sounded like you were saying that the, the things in the New Testament were forecast in the Old Testament. Um, that wasn't specifically what I was saying, I think, um, but like, that is something I believe, that uh, things that happened in the New Testament um, were foretold in the Old Testament. Yes, I would definitely say that. Okay. And, <clears throat> and as interesting as, as the... Um, the biblical context is uh, that you gentlemen are talking about. Uh, I was kind of curious about um, the philosophical arguments that Adam finds um, convincing um, in his faith. I was curious if he could talk a little bit about those. Philosophical arguments that I find convincing. I find a lot of them very convincing, but just because I find them convincing doesn't mean that I think that they are convincing universally. I'd say... Um, my favorite, my favorite one would be um, definitely the ontological argument because it's very fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Alvin Plain's a good ontological argument. Um, <laughs> I think the cosmological argument is really a good one as well, and the moral argument. Those are the three that I like the best. The, uh, say, the, say that one more time, the ontological argument, the moral argument, and which one? Cosmological. Ontological, cosmological, and moral. Um, cosmological. Yes. All right. The, uh, yeah. Okay. I, I, I've got a question before you guys get into talking about these uh, particular philosophical mindsets. And, and, and I, I'm just, you know, I hear uh, Muslims making philosophical arguments. I hear Christians making philosophical arguments. And the Muslims tie it to a different text than the Christians. And they're making the same yeah. philosophical arguments. Uh, what what's the deal uh, with that? Um, if I could, yeah, if I could comment on that, I would say that um, it goes back to that idea of theism, as opposed to like a specific understanding of who God is, uh, what God has revealed, etc. Um, you can, I mean, I guess one of the ways you can do it is say, like, you know, you go to you know your backyard and you point to a tree, and you tell you know one person, okay, you know, look at that tree. Then you take that person out of the backyard and then you bring another person in and then you tell them, you know, and you have them look at the tree. Then you have both of them describe the tree. They'll, they'll look at different uh, aspects of it. Now, I wouldn't argue in a pluralistic sense that, quote, both religions are right or that even either of them are right. Um, they could both be wrong. But I would say that at least, you know, one of them would have to be closer to the truth than the other. Are, are, are you saying that if, if a person has a philosophical argument uh, that uh, either the Muslim or the Christian must be right or possibly could both be wrong? Um, as far as the philosophical arguments, um, I think if I recall correctly, the Kalam cosmological argument is a, uh, initially a, a Muslim one, um, and I would not disagree with it. Um, I mean, now William Lane, William Lane Craig is tying it to Christianity. Yes, but I don't think he would ever argue that. In fact, I, I recall him stating it quite a few times that, like, that that does not, in his mind, prove the Christian God. He's trying to prove 
uh, beyond reasonable doubt the existence of the supreme ultimate being a theistic god in just the general sense. Uh, I mean, this happens all the time. Atheists and Christians, even fundamentalist Christians, will agree that one plus one equals two. Um, it's a very general understanding. Does okay, that make sense? Okay, now I, I interrupted uh, your, your I, I think that you were trying to get Adam to commit a little bit further philosophically. Uh, uh, Christopher, would you take it further? Well, I wasn't really trying to uh, commit him to any, I wasn't trying to nail him down to any particular, any particular philosophy. I was just curious um, if he found that any of those ph philosophical arguments um, valid as evidence as evidence claims for the existence of a god. I tend to not be an evidentialist in that sense. Um, Could you I, explain I that a little bit, please? Like, what do you mean you're not an evidentialist? I don't believe that a good way to uh, sort of prove the existence of God is say, well, you know, I've got this, this data right here has, you know, you know, this sort of evidence, you know, and x plus y equals z. That, that sort of thing. I, I tend to not be sort of that way because I think while it's good to have an intellectual knowledge of God, uh, as mm -hmm. a Christian, I think it should go much deeper. So if um, I would tend to be more of the uh, presuppositional um, Alvin, Alvin Plantinga type of uh, philosopher. He's definitely my favorite apologist, okay. Alvin Plantinga. Which kind of raises the question um, uh, what do you think about? Um, science and the scientific method and the evidences that it provides that counter the need for um, for the existence of the supernatural so in other words um, the application of methodological naturalism in science to come up with the results that it does um, without the use of the supernatural and the progress that it has made yeah I would say that um I think there's two points there. One of them would be they're entirely different subjects. We're talking about science, and uh, when it comes to the question of God, we're talking about philosophy. And um, sure. I don't use historical arguments to try to prove that one plus one equals two. I don't go, you know, this mathematician, you know, in 1430 proved that one plus one equals two, so therefore, like, that's not how it works. Um, that's so I would, that's, I would that's, try that's not a to good example, but I'm, I'm purposely and, and trying to um, I'm purposely trying to get to the area where the the two bump into each other. Where uh, I think Stephen Jay Gould called it the non-overlapping magisteria, right? Noma. I'm trying to get to the area where science kind of does answer some questions that religion does, and religion does kind of raise some questions that science can answer, and. I mean, I, I'm, I guess I'm talking about instead of the air, the examples that you're giving, like science can't answer why mathematical absolutes exist. It can kind of answer some things that religion questions that religion raises, and it answers them pretty deftly. Go ahead. Yeah, could you give me a specific example? I'm sorry. So I'm thinking about things like um, essentially anything supernatural, uh, miracles. Um, the eff efficacy of praying, um, things things like that, or uh, evolution, uh, the existence of evolution, okay. um, as compared Which one you want to, me to take? as compared to people who uh, don't believe in evolution. I, and I don't know what your stance is on evolution, but uh, um, I know that some people have used Christianity and the claims of religion. Um, against science because of philosophical reasons. I've, and you mentioned the presuppositional argument. I've heard people use presuppositional arguments as a way to deter a, a discussion away from a discussion about evidences that go against beliefs that they have. Maybe I'm going off on a tangent here, but I was just trying to get to like where you no, stand on certain, certain hot button topics. Where, when it comes yeah. to theistic versus atheistic uh, philosophies and worldviews. Yeah, I would, I would, I'm sorry, Ethan. Um, yeah, I, I would counter that with, um, to be honest, at least my understanding with presuppositional arguments is that it allows us to focus more on those sort of 
positive arguments against God. Because with the evidentialists, it's kind of like a, you know, well, I'm, uh, I'll see your, you know, problem of evil, and I'll raise you, you know, this, this, and that. And you know, it's kind of like a, we're trying to push evidence against each other and have higher and higher and higher. And I feel like with the presuppositional position, it really just primarily deals with the positive arguments against God's good existence. So that's why I favor presupposition, presuppositionalism, because I feel like it, it just it gets away from all the trying to, you know, my dad can beat up your, you know, non-existent dad kind of thing, you know, whatever, if you understand what I'm saying. Uh, if, if you had to give us a short version, version that is a brief one, uh, of your precept, uh, what would it be? Short version of my presuppositional stance. I would say, for me personally, I, um, I take the existence of God as a presupposition, not because, well, I don't know, and I've never had an experience concerning God, so I'm just going to suppose it's true. It's kind of the, yeah, and not to make it sound like, I guess, quote, this simple, but like, I, I don't question the existence of other people, because you can do all sorts of arguments philosophically to question the existence of people outside of yourself. Um, I mean, solipsism is technically a, you know, a viable option. Um, so I would just say that, yeah, there are these questions, but unless I find a question that is actually a convincing one, um, that really makes me think, oh, yeah, well, that is a good question. Um, I, I don't have a reason to believe that God doesn't exist. Um, and then that just really kind of complements the rest of my life because, you know, aside from that belief that God exists that I take as a presupposition, I see evidence for it just in my own personal life. Minor things mostly, but, you know, some major things like the uh, you know, two experiences that happened prior to what was that last part? Say that last part again, please. Um, minor things mostly, but uh, you know, also include some larger things like the two experiences that happened prior that kind of helped me get back on the road. Uh, if we can, I, I, I would like to go back to some of these Bible questions, if that's... Uh, all right, oh, yeah. because I, I would like to get back into the philosophical arguments, but it, it seems like to me that people want to take a position as a Christian or a Muslim, etc. And for some reason, it seems like they're making this huge leap. And, and the presuppositionalists that we've had on our shows, like Cy Ten Bruggenkate, Eric Hoven, and people of that kind, uh, they have a presup that is is much different than yours, th and, and I'm thankful for that. Unfortunately. Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying that uh, rational arguments are not without lots of assumptions, uh, but, but my point is, let's go back to what we call scripture, um, and I, I don't feel like it's, it's, it's right to call it scripture, but just, just for the sake of making things easy tonight, let's just assume that it is scripture. Why, why would you trust any of Scripture and call it even God's Word? It's not. Um, part of it is the, uh, the understanding that it is a, um, that the New Testament specifically is a very historically reliable um, set of books and epistles. Um, so in the sense of understanding Jesus historically, um, that would be a reason not to quote, think of it as, like, perfectly inspired or anything like that, just to understand that these are reliable texts that tell us about somebody who actually lives. Okay, let, so let, 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 to, let, let me stop okay, you right yeah. there, just just to make a point, because I, I don't want you to go further and commit uh, in, in other areas. When we say that the Bible is reliable, um, I, I'm having a hard time with that, to be honest with you, because, number one, we have no autographer, no original writing of any author. And we simply have copies. We really don't know for certain that any of these documents were actually penned by uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, etc. But it's, it's very much a model of presupposition, very much a leap of faith in a sense that these documents were actually penned by these uh, various people that we claim 
to say that th these are actual documents. And so, uh, it does that bother you? No, for a few reasons. The first one is, I mean, suppose we did know for certain that a guy named Mark wrote Mark. I don't think how that would improve or, you know, decrease the reliability. Like, we don't know how, quote, trustworthy Mark is in that sense. Um, but what's, what is amazing is that you have what are called the Synoptic Gospels, and you have the uh, Gospel of John. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the Synoptic Gospels. And there's, a much, there's enough differentiation between the two, or between the three Synoptic Gospels, to know that they're not just kind of like really just copying each other and you know, writing each other word for word. But they're similar enough to show that there is some sort of reliability in their understanding at least a lot of the major things. Uh, uh, historians, New Testament um, historians agree on quite a bit about what happened uh, concerning Jesus and his life. And a lot of it's the major stuff. Uh, and I'm talking about historians across, all the way even to Bart Her um, Herman. Um, things like, you know, the, the crucifixion of Jesus, you know, Jesus' baptism. Um, the, they would actually even agree that the disciples truly believed that Jesus resurrected, uh, rose again from the dead. Okay, but not that but, they made it up as a story, but they actually genuinely believed it. Okay, but that would be one of the things. But the historians who make those claims are basing their actually their claims based upon a meta language, an extremely synthetic meta language, and I, I would question. Uh, the uh, the truthfulness of these claims in various categories. Number one, just for the sake of argument, let's make it real, real simple. Let's talk about non-linguistic elements for a few minutes. Uh, okay. Let's say that I said something as simple as this, and I give this example all the time because I'm simply a teacher. Uh, I knock the ball out of the park. What does that mean to you? Um. It means, you know, the idea that you kind of a slam dunk argument to use another uh, idiom or whatever the word is. Um, it, it, it's kind of the idea that you you completely won in whether, whether it's an argument or trying to prove something. No, I, I'm simply said, if, if I stated these terms, if I stated this, I knocked the ball out of the park. In other words, if I were a baseball player at some uh, field and I was on a particular team and I knocked the ball over the fence and I ran around all the bases, and I made that statement, I knocked the ball out of the park, what would it mean? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that would mean that you made a home run. I mean... But it, could it not you, also you mean... Did. But But it could it also mean that, uh, wow, I just won the confidence of my other uh, players? Uh, could it not also mean uh, I had just impressed the girl on the second row? Uh, could it not also mean something uh, that was very... Uh, a connecting point with the young man's mother that was sitting on, say, the fourth row. Uh, you see my point? Yeah. In other words, if we look at a guitar player, for instance, Christopher, he's an amazing bass player. You know, he could walk off stage after, you know, one of these uh, solo acts that he does with slap bass, and I wish he would do it tonight, but he can't. Unfortunately, he could walk off stage and simply say, it, you know, the same thing. I knocked the ball out of the park. And so unless we have these non-linguistic elements, and I'm not talking about just the external elements, but also the internal elements, inside of the head and outside of the head, how can we actually tell what a person means, even though we may be the player surrounding the person who actually said, I knocked the ball out of the park in a baseball game? I, I'm simply saying sometimes we just don't know. Would you admit to that? Um, yeah, sometimes I guess you could say we just don't know, but there are some pretty clear texts, not only within the scripture, but with out the New Testament scriptures. But but my question um, would be, where are the non-linguistic elements that these historians are using? Um, I'm not a, uh, uh, I don't have a doctor in uh, history, um, but I would say, I, I would just point to the fact that, I mean, across the board, uh, historians on the New Testament, from people like, uh, you know, N.T. Wright, all the way to people like Bart Ehrman, agree on these things. So I would have to say that they, While they, these linguistic things may cause some minor differences of opinions, I think it's a bit too much of a postmodern kind of route to kind of just say, well, then we don't know anything about, you know, what happened in the past. 
Because uh, then you could argue that with everything. You could argue that with, I mean, Christopher Columbus. That's true. Uh, well, that's did true. he really sail across the Atlantic? I mean, you know, those, those sorts of things. Because well, you're getting into really scary territory there. But, but I mean, in recent history, for instance, uh, what historians were saying years ago concerning World War One and World War Two and even Vietnam, all of that's been rewritten by better finds and better methods and practices. And my point is, Bart, Bart Edelman is actually on my side on this. And, and so is N.T. Wright when questioned about the non-linguistic elements. He doesn't claim that we have all of them. He's simply saying, based upon the assumption that we are using one particular model of synthetic language um, that we call, you know, uh, a modeling syndrome, this would be true if, in fact, that this is true. But that is, uh, none of this could be true uh, if, 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 if we're basing it actually on the facts of actually having the evidence. And I'm simply saying that the evidence, uh, that is, these elements are certainly not something that we have. Uh, you know, the language was lost, all kinds, you know, this is a dead language. This is something that, uh, I mean, it's very difficult to do uh, something like this in our lifetime with people that we know personally. And, and to suggest that we can do this with a dead language, a language that we actually lost and we can reconstruct it and go A to Z with it, I, I find that to be a far-fetched idea. I would say that, well, it's not a language that is used, obviously, in, a, in the, uh, the common you know, tongue right now. It's something that, uh, I mean, for instance, Eastern Orthodox have used it for quite a long time. Um, they're kind of the counterparts of the Roman Catholics, uh, you know, in the Middle East and stuff. And I think that when it comes to language, uh, yeah, it changes. Um, yeah, we may not know some, you know, all the idioms and everything that goes there, but we, can, they're just with every statement that people make, you have to make statements with assumptions. I mean, absolutely every bit of information that you can ever utter would have to have at least a few assumptions. Um, I don't think it's possible to, you know, share knowledge without assumptions. So I, I wouldn't look at assumptions in and of themselves as bad. I just think that it, it's just that's the way that we have to work that way. There are minor assumptions that we have to just accept as true. Are, are you aware that Jesus, for the most part, supposedly spoke in Aramaic? Are you aware that much of what supposedly he said can't be back translated back into Aramaic from the Greek? I'm aware that uh, he spoke Aramaic, yes, um, very likely. And I'm aware that at least some of it seems to be that it's not easily translatable back. Um, as far as, uh, I, I know some have, some parts, uh, but not, I, that, that's once again, uh, you know, a language I, I'm not an expert in Greek or Aramaic, so I, I wouldn't be able to comment Are very, you? very intelligibly about it. <clears throat> well, uh, Christopher, you confess that you're not a Bible scholar, but... No, and I was, but I was actually going to ask Dr. Jones, I mean, he's, he's singing my song. So, like, I was going to ask what, what him. What song like, is that? Are you going to play bass to it? <laughs> Let me go get my bass. It's right around the corner right here. I'll just there grab it. All um, right. Well, I, the, I'm Rhonda Jones asking you a question. <laughs> <laughs> you said you're not a Bible scholar, and uh, that's fine. But what value do you place on the Old Testament, the New Testament? Uh, do, you, do you give one... Uh, Testament more credence than the than the other, or or what? In general, I think that the Bible is a wonderful book of literature, and it can be used. You know, um, the the Bible of the Old Testament seems a little angry, and the Bible of the New Testament seems very loving and forgiving. Um, in general, if I can paint in super broad strokes, right. Um, uh, I think that there are definitely, you know, if you use a cherry picking approach, you can certainly get wonderful things out of the Bible. But like I said, that's a cherry picking approach from my perspective. Um, reading it in full, it kind of makes things um, difficult. Um, 
I, I certainly don't understand literalistic interpretations of it. Um, I certainly have a difficult time determining where things are meant to be taken as metaphor or analogy or poems or, you know, things like that. I, I've never studied it to that degree. Um, so, uh, in in my world, uh, I mean, I have I have the Bible app on my iPhone, um, which is a wonderful uh, app. In case you you know, if anyone's curious about uh, Bible apps. Um, it goes, you know, it gives you like all the different versions, and you know, like last week when Dr. Jones was um, talking about, um, he was reading from Scripture and he was analyzing it. I was reading right along with him as he was going through his analysis. You know, I think that it's an important book to have um, because this particular debate between atheism and theism is a uh, um, close to my heart. Um, I think that it's important for me to have it as a reference. So that's, that's kind of where it stands in my world. It's a wonderful book of literature. It's a reference manual. And beyond that, uh, I don't really see it as a holy book. Um, I, I very much agree with the people who study it from a more historical perspective. Uh, I agree with what Dr. Jones is saying that, you know, based on what we know about how it was compiled, it's very difficult to interpret it as being anything other than the product of the fallibility of the humans that put it together. Sure. Well, do you believe that Jesus um, is an actual historical figure? I'm certainly willing to believe that, yes. Okay. Uh, Adam, I've, I've got a few more questions yeah. for you, and I and we hope have plenty that in the chat room. We have plenty, plenty of questions in the chat room. That's that's good. That's always healthy. Uh, I, I hope that I'm not f making you feel uncomfortable, Adam. Am I? Oh no, no. I, it, this is uh, the uh, linguistics and stuff is a bit above my pay grade, so I, I'm just gonna have to say that I rely on, I, I like like we all do. We rely on people much smarter than our, ourselves. And I'm looking at people like N.T. Wright, people like Bart Ehrman. That kind of goes the full spectrum pretty much. And they very much agree on a lot of what, uh, of, the, of the claims about Jesus. Um, well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not dismissing that they do not agree, uh, quote unquote, on some claims of Jesus. That is, as uh, we understand a particular model of metalanguage. For instance, I would agree that the NIV states X, Y, and Z. I would agree that the King James Bible translators uh, gave us a document that says something that's quite subsequent to uh, what the NIV translators are suggesting. And I think the intent of various translators have different ideas. And when you get into the game of actually linguistics people are simply admitting yeah this is true if we use this synthetic model of translation theory yeah i can admit that this is true and i can admit to certain modelings of jesus in various categories but my question is uh, these same people if i ask them where do we have uh, the ability to actually recreate if you will the gestures of jesus because for instance, if I'm looking at my wife and I wink at her while I'm talking with her, my simple wink or my gestures uh, change the meaning completely of what my words mean. Would you agree with that? It can, definitely, uh, yeah. I would say. And I, I'm simply saying that Jesus and, and all of us, when we are using all of these phonemes that we keep using, uh, they are not understood with the ear only. They are understood with the eye. They are understood, you know, it's feel, touch, etc. It's 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 a very complex thing. And in fact, we also have something called a genome that we rely on to understand, you know, certain complexities within the linguistic field. But my point is, how can we say that we actually know what Jesus said? or actually claim that Jesus said X, Y, or Z. And I'm talking about in a way that the church speaks because they claim this is actually God's word. And, and I, I guess my question is leading to this. Do you believe that these words in this book are the very words of God or is this just what man said God said? Um, that's a tough question. I would say because the first one, it tends to be more of like the, uh, the, the 
Islamic view of, say, the, you know, of the Quran. Um, and I would say that uh, we don't, as Christians, or shouldn't at least, have that sort of view of, of Scripture in the sense that, like, God dictated it and the people are just kind of, like, writing or reciting it or whatever. Um, I'm sorry, one second. Um, I'm sorry, one second. Okay, I think that Adam has had to take a call. Yeah. Uh, you want to well, go over some of Before these, we or? go to the comments, I, I wanted to get one uh, question answered uh, from Christopher. You said that I was singing your song. What, what did you Absolutely. mean by that? Well, it seems like um, you are very critical of the Old Testament and interpretations of the New Testament. So I guess I have a question for you. Uh, where do you stand on interpretations of the Old and New Testament? Uh, that's a very good question. I would say that I probably know less than 5% of what any of the authors of the New Testament actually said. Uh, I, I don't think that it's possible to know any more than maybe 10% of what is there uh, there are too many guessing games going on, and uh, I, I, I think that we have, you know, if, for instance, when you're going through the text A to Z, uh, the Old Testament, for instance, there is no way that we can adequately say within reason that we know any of it. Uh, the New Testament, uh, I, I would say that... Uh, that we have the possibility of recreating models of the languages, uh, namely of the New Testament. When I say languages, uh, it wasn't just Koine Greek, but it was also a mixture of Attic Greek. And so that has to be reconstructed to understand the text. And another thing has to be reconstructed it has to do with the text itself, because these models are much variegated. In other words, Every translation that you're looking at out there is based upon a text base, and there are various text bases out there. And so when people talk to me about theology and they claim that, oh, this Bible of mine is the authority, it's the Word of God, I normally ask questions like, uh, which text base are you actually basing that upon? Because a text base <laughs> is actually a gathering of various manuscripts, and it's been put there... Uh, for the sense of making a complete text, because we don't have a complete text of anything. And so we so simply let me have a bunch of fragments. Uh, let me I, turn the question on you. Let me turn the question on you. What text What text base do you consider um, authoritative? I, I, I don't find any of them authoritative. Okay. And okay. so um, I'm but, having a hard time you, hearing you. you. If they'll turn your volume up, that would be nice. But I, I don't find any of them to be authoritative, if, if that answers your question. Um, one more question, but, but you do place a little bit of your faith in, in the Bible, in the scripture? Okay, uh, I'm hearing two different monitors here, and so if you can repeat that, so I can sure. hear that. Christopher, yeah. Christopher, would you repeat that? Okay. Oh. Um, but, so you place, you place some faith in the validity of the Bible? I place no faith in the validity no. of the Bible, none. Okay, okay. In other words, my, my, I, I look at things like this. Uh, I, I'm not a person who is um, a person who wants to make a lot out of faith or believing. I, I think that uh, I would rather look at the evidence and look at the text for what it is. And at, at some point, if I react to it, it is what it is. And so I'm not suggesting that I don't believe X, Y, or Z. I'm simply saying that it's not a matter of faith to me. Because when I see the usages, for instance, of the Apostle Paul dealing with a Greek term, not every usage that he utilizes with this particular term, pistis, is egalitaric, not one and the same. But he uses pistis in the context sometimes as a body of truth. And that makes sense to me. And so okay. to him... It's not faith to him. It's a body of truth. Now, he, he does say it's from faith to faith, and I could rattle it in this context. In other words, the syntax would lead us to believe that 
Paul was one in transition. In other words, he would advocate that we keep moving from faith to faith to faith, better put from body of truth to body of truth to body of truth, because he thought that rethinking and rethinking and rethinking was a positive thing to do. He was not stuck in fixed belief. Therefore, it wasn't a matter of faith to him. I think that faith has uh, been Christianized. It's, it's, it's a spurious term in a sense to the text itself. Okay. And, and so, um, if I, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm having a hard time hearing both of you. Can we turn uh, just them up a little bit so I can hear? You have the monitors and your own mic on the same channel. Okay, okay. They're telling me that I'm going to have to get by without hearing um, adequately. So you guys just do the best that you can, and we'll struggle through this. Let's get ready okay, to Adam, I think you're talking. Go for it. Yeah, if um, yeah, if I can respond on the textual thing. Um, I would say that, uh, for instance, you know, the Nesilon 28th edition, um, the UBS, you know, things like that, they, they are very much complete. Uh, there are a few questions in the sense of, well, is it this reading and that reading, but there's nothing that really would change the theology of, of the scripture if you use the same hermeneutics. So um, I, I would say that it seems like... But, but let, uh, me, let me stop you there. When you say use the same hermeneutics, hermeneutics, that's kind of like a trap term. In other words, if I use the same synthetic model of translation theory, for instance, if I use direct modeling, I'm going to come up with a certain conclusion. That's true. But if I use oblique methods, it's going to come out completely different. And so that's a very subjective sense. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? Not quite sure what you're saying, no. In other words, if I use direct te techniques as opposed to oblique techniques in translation theory, it's going to come out differently. In other words, uh, it's, this, this is not just an argument about looking at the text. It's, it's an argument about how we translate the text. You know, there is translating, there is interpreting, and sometimes it's like Olympic circles. Sometimes they do have some things in common and sometimes things not. And so uh, this is something that we have to pay careful attention to. And so it's true if you use a, a, a certain hermeneutical model, if you will, for instance, the Protestants are very prone to use grammar uh, as part of their hermeneutic. However, they do not use legitimate grammar because in, uh, if, if I were to use a determinate language, uh, language theory truly is grammar itself. And there is no New Testament Greek grammar to date that anyone has written. All of these things are spurious rites. And I can say that as a linguist and would challenge every grammar to this date because the grammars have not dealt properly with language acquisition to date. They are not dealing with the nativist uh, viewpoint nor the internalist, etc. Uh, in fact, they are behind in the times when it comes to what's called um, the royal uh, port uh, grammarians. They are behind in the times concerning that. And that's why when I look at rights, uh, W-R-I-T-E-S, like uh, Daniel Wallace has out beyond Greek, uh, that is the basics, I, I think that his work is pitiful. And all of your classical professors, that is of classical Greek, are laughing because they know that it's simply a, an exegetical work based upon a hermeneutic and not true translation theory or good linguistics. And there's a difference between a grammarian and actually a linguist in that kind of context. But I, I would still find a problem with that because, I mean, throughout the history of, I mean, the past 2,000 years, I mean, go back to as, as, as far as you want, um, it seems much of the historic, like, the, the historians seem to at least have a, a general consensus about our understanding of, of what the text says. You know, they may say, well, this is false and this is not false, but they at least have a general consensus. Where, where, where um, is the general consensus? I, I, I want to see that because we don't even have a general consensus today of what a deponent is. I would like to see one oh, English oh, translation. Oh, 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 uh, of what a deponent is. I don't see a consensus when it comes to the edits, the first and the second. There isn't a consensus. You can look in en any English translation and you can look at the translation modeling. We do not have a consensus. That is not true. 
Um, no, no, you would not have an entirely different religion, for instance, if you went from, say, the ESV to the NIV. You wouldn't say, oh, now I've got to, I don't know, worship Buddha now. Like, it, it, it's, it's, there, there is a general consensus. Now, are there minor differences? Yes, but I mean, no, I let, can, let's talk about I linguistic consensus because I agree that the NIV translators have a preface to their work. They are satisfying 50 plus denominations. And with that said, they do have to satisfy theology. They are not there to do a good job to satisfy what okay. the text actually says. I know several of the translators with good friends with several of them. One now is uh, wow. deceased, but they told me that this was a pitiful, pitiful attempt because they were under the controlling factors of, of people who were push pushing theology. Okay. Um, For instance, you would not have hell in the New Testament if it were left up to the translators. The only reason that hell was even included in the New Testament, it's because of the, the, the theologians who were writing the contract for these dear people. Um, I would say in response to that, I, like, you, uh, for instance, look at, say, like a, a Catholic translation, or, I mean, say, take something that's even really, really different, quote, really, really different, like, you take the widest difference as possible, something like the uh, New American Standard Bible versus, say, like the King James, they're actually based on different texts. Uh, the Texas Receptus for the King James and, you know, the Nestle Elan, uh, I think it's 26, for the New American Standard. But not um, just based upon a different you, text you base, but d based upon a different synthetic model of translation theory, which makes a complete difference. Yeah, I know. But what I'm saying is that you will find that someone following, say, the King James versus someone following, you know, the New American Standard, they will arrive at a lot of the same conclusions. Um, and they're using completely different, not completely different in the sense of, like, they're not the same text, but, like, they're different texts, but they, they are, they have differences in them between the two. Okay, well, um, but, but you, so you're, I'm, you're, I'm, you're going to have to understand one thing when you look at the New American Standard. It's, it's, it's modeled after tradition, the tradition of the church, and it's 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 modeled after that. And and please keep in mind when you look at Dr. Ann Nyland. I don't know if you're aware of Dr. Ann Nyland. She put out a particular translation of the New Testament, and I think it was in 2004, 2005, and it completely dismisses uh -huh. the idea of homosexuality as being a sin, et cetera, et cetera. And many people are, are in an uproar over that. Now, she has all the support from uh, the Nylans, the Allens, uh, and, and, and even, you know, uh, you know, Bruce Metzger, et cetera, have, have given uh, her lots of applause before her, her work. And, and here she is. She has spent a lifetime as, uh, as one looks, looking at this as a lexical theorist. And she's not a theologian. She's simply trying to do the work, trying to say that we have to create these models once again because for hundreds of years, all of this was based upon a spurious attempt. It was based upon Holy Ghost Greek grammar, and which was nonsense or bullshit. Yeah, I, I would respond in, uh, and say with, uh, as far as um, the idea of homosexuality in the New Testament, um, the word arsenokoites is is the word for, you know, homosexual and stuff. Um, and, oh, shoot, I just, I just lost my point. Um, basically, the point is, like, for instance, that, that example, um, it, it, it's, if you look at other historians looking at those types of things, I, I know um, I'm trying to think of some people right now, but, for instance, the idea of homosexual, I, I guess I'll just have to, I, I had a point, and I'm sorry, I forgot about it. But um, back to... The idea of a single person doing a um, translation, I don't know if that's the best way to do it. Well, um, well l l I think that there needs to be consensus, and that's what's done with almost every single translation out there. If I could ask, what would you say are the two most different translations of, say, the New Testament? What are the two furthest apart from each other? I, I, I think that that's a failed question, number one, because we're not comparing apples to apples. We're not talking about people using the same translation theory with the same text base. We're talking about people are, who are using critically so different kinds of, and I keep stressing, synthetic translation theories. And, and please understand that these guys are not basing these things on models 
that have been created to where, uh, and I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but people are actually taking this back into conversational koine today. In other words, you really don't know what a language says unless you can speak it fluently. And people uh -huh. now are realizing that let's not just leave the language dead and be afraid of it. Let's put it back together right. and see if we can learn how to get the rhythm of the text in a living, breathing language. Because this is not a determinate language. It does not have uh -huh. fixed definitions like we have in science, if you will. This is simply a, a, yes. a bunch of manuscripts written by people who are all over the place metaphorically, et cetera. And we're talking about translations of something. Yeah. In other words, we have Greek satisfying the words of Jesus. Jesus wasn't using Greek, but this is a translation, a perception of what Jesus was saying, yada, yada, yada. And so uh -huh. my point is we do not have any of the original writings of any of the authors of scripture and in these books, and it needs to be pointed out, the syntax is so much different and so much different to where when you look at the uncial documents as opposed to the minuscule documents, and please understand that yeah. all of our text bases are based upon the interpretation of uncial documents. And that's pitiful because we need, need to understand the better method of understanding the, the uncial or the uncial product because the uncial product is built upon a basis that actually articulates something that would be more similar to a first century read. This is not what you have when you're reading an English Bible. What you have when you're reading an English Bible is an interpretation of word division, uh. et cetera. And, and, and we are finding that much of this has been uh, wrongly done simply because we keep finding uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of more manuscripts and the more manuscripts we find, we have more and more and more textual variants. Right now there are only uh, 400,000 textual variants and that's about all. Well, I would say with the 400,000, first of all, that's, um, that's including absolutely every single thing, like for instance, an, Ameri an English equivalent would be like the difference between A and N. That has absolutely no impact on the text itself. That, that's, that, that is yeah, not true. Of differences. I, I, I mean, I, I, would, I would agree in the majority of the instances, and, but, but you're talking about admittedly by Daniel Wallace, a very renowned Protestant uh, scholar. He says that there are exceptions, that is within the 1% to 2% category. So one to two percent oh, yeah. of four hundred thousand is a huge number, and my point is this: if you change augment one word in a movie, you can change the entire plot. And so you do the numbers yeah, in the no, in the I'm text itself. The argument, yeah. And so if you have one to two percent out of four hundred thousand that would be in question, it could throw the plot off entirely. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't disagree in that sense. But what I'm saying is that I, I think for the four hundred thousand number it tends to be thrown around too much. Um, once again, it, it, it's things that even Mark Aaron himself would, uh, would say that the vast majority of them do not matter in any way, shape, or form. Now, well, if I can get back to the idea of the uh, translations uh, They They, they uh, do matter. Your, just your just a minute, just a minute. They, 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 for instance, they, they uh, do matter in matching. They do matter in matching manuscript to manuscript to put these various kinds of manuscripts together because we could not match them if we did not have uh, to deal with these uh, different concepts. And please understand that we keep finding and will continue to find the more archaeological works that we have in the makings, we will probably find wow. thousands upon thousands of manuscripts that would raise uh, this amount. And, and this raises serious questions. And so once again, we have various problems. And, okay. and by the way, in that number, that is 400,000 textual variants, that doesn't include uh -huh. the syntactic uh, variants that okay. we have within the scripture, which is another cup of tea that none of these guys are willing to deal with because it cripples the text if, entirely. If I could bring up a question then, a, a, a few, because uh, I wanted to see if I could respond to There's so much that I wasn't able to respond to yet. Um, one of the problems I see is that, uh, I mean, you're looking at the history of, of Christianity and very much a lot of, the, uh, very much, you know, the important uh, beliefs are all, you know, are, are held uh, by a, a large amount of Christians throughout the, the centuries. And you're looking at people who, in the second century, translated it from Greek to Syriac. 
uh, in the uh, third or fourth century translated it from Greek to Latin. Um, you're looking at various translations by people who spoke those languages. And so what I'm saying is I, I see this, you know, these multiple languages in the Syriac uh, manuscripts, in the Latin manuscripts, and they all seem to be in their own, you know, their own languages coming to the same consensus. There's not major differences in them that would give reason to, to, to be, you know, unreasonably worried about or whatever. You know, there's no reason to be, you know, overly worried about these type, types of things. You could get a Syriac Bible from that time, and if you spoke Syriac um, or were fluent in that ancient language, um, able to read it at the very least, you would not come away with some sort of, you know, belief that Jesus was a, you know, was whatever, was a woman and she had, you know, two disciples and, you know, she didn't die on a cross, she actually didn't die, she, you know, there, there's, there's not some sort of major ambiguity there. Now, are there minor ambiguities? Possibly. I, I, but I don't see things that should give me reason to be concerned any more than I should be concerned about any different language. Well, like, let, let me just ask you a point um, blank question. Can you point yes. me to a source that would give me the non-linguistic elements that are essential for determining syntagmatic and paradigmatic analysis? Could you point me toward that? I'd like to have that in my possession. <laughs> that sentence is way above my pay grade. <laughs> well, I, I'm simply saying that there is no way to determine meaning without syntagmatic and paradigmatic analysis, and you can't do that without non-linguistic essentials. And so what you're so saying, saying is we have all of this and you don't have the non-linguistic elements. And what I'm saying is that there are, I gave three different languages in which you can find. And well, that's superfluous. You can have different. all of the writings that you want, but if you do not have the non-linguistic elements, you have no clue as to what any of those are. The, the non-linguistic in the sense of like hand gestures and stuff like that? In other words, we're, we're talking about gesturing, we're talking about the ambience, we're yeah. talking about okay. all kinds of saying. things when it I comes would say to that. that the, these, are not, these are not scripts of videos or movies, though. These are... These are, are, are we saying that the telling of the parables that Jesus was teaching these individuals, are we saying that they had no non-linguistic elements? Is that what you're saying? Um, I'm saying that they're not non-linguistic elements that are unnecessary, like that are necessary in order to understand it, because these are people who are writing. They're not, they're not thinking, okay, I'm going to make it big in Hollywood and I'm going to you know, do a movie, so let me, here's the script. So when Jesus in chapter 3, in chapter 3 of the book of John. If I can finish this, um, go if I can finish this point. It, um, what, what I'm saying is that they're not looking at this from a, a movie scriptural, you know, script basis. They're looking at this as I'm trying to convey to people, people around me, um, you know, who are reading or are going to have this read to them, what Jesus was like. So I've, you know, gotten these eyewitnesses, uh, and I, thank you very much. And, um, you know, and I'm going to convey to them the stories of what they have told me. And I'm going to add whatever is necessary, uh, whatever is necessary for them to understand what happens. Does that make sense? So there's not a need for, like, well, I wonder, you know, what was happening as far as Jesus' hand? Was it raised up or was it lowered? Because the, the writers of those books did not need that. What they needed was, well, just what they wrote. So I don't see a reason to believe that, like, they're looking at this as, as some sort of like TV script where in parentheses, you know, you have to add, and, you know, this person looks suspicious while saying that. Th that's just not necessary. Uh, all you need is what they wrote because that's all that they have. That's their communication. So what they're saying is that they're, they're, they're writing these books, these epistles, especially looking at the epistles, because the epistles are letters. They're, they're not stories. They're letters explaining things. He's not, you know, Paul and James and Peter are not trying to like tell some sort of fiction or not or you know some sort of novel or something they're just writing hey this is how we should act as christians so i, I don't even especially with that i don't see that as a problem but not even with the uh, gospels i can see that as a problem i i completely disagree with you on many different levels and i i would like to do a show on that with you if if you would be willing because i, I would like to deal with the conversation that jesus had with nicodemus how could we actually understand that without the non-linguistic elements? Can you tell me how we could do that? 
what is their, I mean, the non-linguistic elements that aren't there? Because they well, I'm explain. simply saying I, I need non-linguistic elements. In other words, when I'm talking with my wife and I'm having a conversation, huh. if I say something to her, we have unique words that we say to each other. Uh, like I said, yeah. if a baseball okay. player at a baseball game uh, says, I knocked a home run, that doesn't necessarily mean that he knocked the ball over the fence. It means that he could yeah. have something that he was saying to impress the girl on the second row. Huh. You don't know that until you get inside that guy's head. So it's in the head knowledge that well, we need outside of the head knowledge. You have too many different variables involved in actually establishing what was meant uh, in that kind of context. I, I, I'm sure that well, we can play a guessing game, but this is not what uh, the church is doing. They are claiming that we know exactly what Jesus said. We know exactly what Paul was writing. Paul was writing in a particular context. He was writing out of his heart. You can't tell me that you know everything that he thought. You can't tell me all of his emotions and the purpose and the intent. And this is what I'm talking about. I don't think that anyone has actually given us all of that or a method to be able to actually, uh, you know, reconstruct that genuinely. Yeah. And so uh, you're I, not I on the side. You're not on the side of the linguist. You're on the side of faith. And so I can understand your point of view coming from the side of faith, but I, I from the linguistic community, there's just absolutely no evidence. Uh, Christopher, yeah, do you I, have I, something to say in this in, in this conversation? Well, I, was, I had actually had a, I had a question for Adam. Yeah. Um, I was just yeah. curious, uh, Adam, uh, how important is the validity of the Bible to you? Um, the validity of the Bible is important to me. Um, I, I think that if I can't rely on especially the New Testament, that I can't rely on much else information about Jesus. So it's a means to an end of understanding what Jesus taught. And if I could add a, another thing uh, to the previous uh, uh, dialogue, um, it, these are, once I, as I said before, these are letters and uh, books written to people, not to any one person for the most part. Um, there might be one or two that are to personal people. Um, but most of them are to uh, uh, an audience. So just like I can, I, I don't need to know the non-linguistics of, say, someone, you know, the president giving a speech to America, I don't need to know those for, um, you know, the ones that aren't mentioned for these books. So I, I, I really don't see how that's a problem if they're in, since their intent is to convey a message to people, not to one particular person. And even then, I mean, you, you can't rely on non-linguistics for, you know, one-on-one -on -one writing to each other. It's just not. Well, you can't I, do that. Out, out of curiosity, if I gave you a letter that I wrote to my wife, are you saying that you could completely understand it? No, but once again, that's only to one person. Well, if I wrote a letter to uh, 500 people, could you understand what I wrote to 500 people? If I wrote to everyone sure. in the New Covenant group, could you really understand what I actually wrote? Because I'd be glad to pin out that letter. Yeah, I'm sure I can understand what you wrote, because if it's to a group of people, and you're writing not to one particular person, and even with the one particular person, I could definitely get at least, you know, 75%, unless you were intentionally doing it in code or something, at the very least, 75%. I might not understand certain little things, but, I mean, actually be closer to like 90% that I could understand. There would just maybe be some little things, unless an intentional, you know, code language is used. Um, I could understand. So I, I really don't understand this, this, this problem with the non-linguistics, because this is a medium that it does not rely on non-linguistics. It is. I, 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 I can't understand why you keep saying that this is something that doesn't require non-linguistic uh, analysis or the elements because we're not talking because about a language, language that's a determinant language. We're not talking about a science book. We're talking about people who use extreme metaphor and idioms. And so, you know, what, what you're talking about is we have to be able to attach these things not just to gestures, but we have to attach these things properly in the way that these people actually utilized 
uh, these idioms, these nuances, and all the things that they're doing in speech. The same thing is true when I'm writing to people. I'm a certain kind of individual as opposed to my wife. And it's rare, by the way, that people actually read books. We have to teach and teach and teach and teach people concentrate, focus on the intent of the author. Most of the time students never do get the entire or the complete intent of any author after they've spent years studying, um, let's say a modern author, much less an author that's 2,000 years uh, far removed from us. Uh, hopefully you can see well, my point. I don't think it's, it's, a, it's an either or of like either 100% or it's no percent though. I mean, I can understand whatever anyone writes unless it's an intentional like code language or something and um, I, I just I really don't see that that problem because these are people who are trying to convey a story who are trying to you know whether or not you want to say it's true or whatever they're trying to convey information to other people they're not going to hide that they're not going to talk in some sort of secret code no, or but... you know without important gestures or something like that they're they're writing it with the intent to give information to people. And I, I just, I, I, I don't see that as a problem. I, but I, 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 yeah, I, just, I don't see it as a problem. <laughs> okay, let's move on from this point. Uh, I, I disagree with you. I, I don't think that common language is without a lot of ambiguity, but uh, you seem to think that it's quite clear. Uh, and I'm not being sarcastic, I'm just disagreeing with you. Uh, but uh, we have uh, many people making statements. Honey, would you read some of these? Uh, you go ahead. There are too many for me to too many to pick. Um, it's just yeah. Since so there are many. so numerous uh, and we have very little time, uh, let's go ahead and, and move on a little bit further. Uh, where are you currently? That is in your theology, Adam, and 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 why? Um, ooh. A lot of various things. Um, some of my favorite, I'll just I'll give a list of uh, some theologians that I really admire as a kind of shorthand, and then I'll touch on some serious, you know, big issues for me. Um, N.T. Wright, uh, Jerry Walls, Greg Boyd, um, Alvin Plantinga. Um, those are the big ones that I really, really admire. I would say, um, as far as certain things, um, when it comes to the doctrine of hell, I'm an, uh, an annihilationist. I believe that. Uh, God, I think it's very clear in Scripture, both Old and New Testament, that God is actually going to um, annihilate the, the wicked rather than kind of keep them in hell eternally, kind of you know torturing them for all eternity. I would, uh, as far as exegetically and as far as philosophically and as far as um, just kind of the nature of God Himself, I just don't see that as a viable option. Um, uh, other things, uh, obviously, like I said before, I'm a Trinitarian. I believe in the deity of Christ. Uh, most Christians believe that and have believed that. Uh, I'm not sole a scriptura in the sense that I don't believe that scripture is the only thing that we should look at when it comes to uh, theology. Uh, I believe reason, scripture, tradition, and experience are the four that we should look at. Um, and, you know, go from there. Uh, let me think what else. Uh, I'm an Anglican. Uh, I recently became an Anglican uh, this year. I'm getting confirmed in October. Uh, so, uh, but not part of the Episcopal Church. I'm part of the Anglican Church of North America, which is a, a more conservative uh, sect of Anglicanism. Um, so that's kind of where I am right now. Hmm. Well, I'm certainly enjoying listening to your words and heart, and I appreciate you being so much in this conversation tonight, Adam. Uh, we do have some viewer comments, and I didn't think we were going to have enough time, but we're going to make the time to read some of them. Honey, would you read some of them? Um... Okay, well, I'll start at the end and, and work my way up. Um, Duff Rick says, in other words, don't take the Bible literally. For me? I, um, I would imagine so. Um, the word literally is kind of tricky. I would say that there are different genres within um, the uh, New Testament and the Old Testament. Um, literally actually historically means in its proper context. So you don't take a poem, uh, like something like the Psalms, and you know, where it says God is a rock or something like that, and think, okay, well, wait, what kind of rock is God? Is he igneous? Is he, you know, sedimentary? What, you know, what kind of rock? Like that's, so you put it in its proper context. 
if it's poetic, you treat it poetically. If, you, if it's apocalyptic, like Revelation uh, or major parts of Daniel, you would take those apocalyptically. If it's historically, you take it historically, and you know, so on and so forth. Okay, uh, the cutoff was brutal there. What, what cutoff is I don't that? know. I'm reading comments. Okay, I understand. Okay, uh, Bob Graves, does he have a choice? Um, I'm sorry? I'm, I'm just reading some comments. Okay, sure. We're getting comments from people in the audience, and uh, our comments are very, very failed tonight. That is in how we are getting them on our cell phones. And so I do apologize to our audience uh, on air if we are failing to understand the intent of your question or point or comment. And so would you read a few more? Uh, I think Joey wants to read some. Okay, yeah. I, I'm just gonna run through it here. We, we did get a ton of uh, comments tonight and uh, they're hard to sort through on a telephone. So uh, let me just scroll real quickly through these. Uh, Bob says, Christopher is a very good bass player. Enjoyed his videos. Uh, Ram yeah. Shaka says, nice and laid back, enjoying the pace and tone thus far. Um, and uh, Kevin, uh, Kelvin, Kelvin uh, Ang, or Ong, sorry. Uh, the first step to becoming an atheist is reading the Bible. Uh, Bob Graves says, Jesus was mocking the fake purity of Pharisees when talking about lust. Uh, Dufrick says, uh, how is the Bible uh, or any religious text cosmological? Uh, and then he says, how do we distinguish acts for, uh, by God from natural processes? We'll just scroll down a bit here. Uh, let's see. Um, just a guy 888 says, uh, historians agree 90% of Luke is copied from Mark and 55% of Matthew is copied from Mark. Um, let's see. Uh, grab a couple here. Uh, Keith Schneider says, I'm sorry. Uh, well, actually, let me uh, skip that one. That was a little, uh, little blunt, Keith. Uh, let's uh, let's move on. Uh, some uh, some cursing acronyms in that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Um, Alan in studio says non linguistics meaning carrying a message in a certain way, gestures and inflections in the speaker's voice can carry their own message. Um, and uh, let me there's let's see. Let me read just a couple more and then we'll be done for the night. Just make sure that our uh, audience gets a voice here. Um, all right. Uh, okay. All right, here we go. Uh, Ep 2012 says, uh, I think Adam is going to lose his faith after Dr. Jones is done with him. Uh, he's putting a lot of doubt into Adam's head if, uh, if uh, Adam accepts what Dr. Jones is saying. Uh, he's very good. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Sorry, guys. Um, uh, Kevin, uh, Kelvin uh, Nguyen says that is a really good point, doctor. And uh, I guess I'm going to stop there. Adam, have you lost your faith? Oh, definitely no. <laughs> I was a little bit confused at, at his, his argument as far as the non-linguistics, but once I understood it, I, I see what what our differences are on that. Um, but no, definitely not. I'm, definitely haven't lost my face. Okay. All right, great. Take that at 2012. All right, we, uh, I'm done with the comments. Uh, let, let's continue. Uh, I, I want to know what your thoughts are, uh, Adam, concerning the Bible. Why do you, I, I mean, do you feel like the Bible is the word of God uh, that is what God actually said, or is it what man said God said? Which is it? Uh, definitely closer to the second one. I think that's what I was wanting to say before, but uh, I think something happened. I was getting in the car or something. Um, yeah, definitely closer to the second one, what man said God said. Um, yeah, the, the first one tends to be more of an Islamic understanding of, of their scriptures. Uh, Christopher, if you had yes. to make a compelling argument to tell a theist to become an atheist, would you do so? No. No. We're not, we're not um, as far as, well, I, if I can speak for atheists in general, I would say, uh, which I really can, I would say we're not in the business of recruiting. Um, 
there are ha atheists that live happy, fulfilling lives. There are theists that live happy, fulfilling lives. Uh, I'm not into proselytizing or recruiting. That's wonderful. You know, one of the things that we enjoy here at the New Covenant Group is diversity. We like listening to what other people perceive to be true. We like to think that we can listen and give and take and have a passionate discussion. Uh, we're not trying to convert anyone. And, and please understand, Adam, I, I don't want you to think uh, that I'm trying to convert you. I, I'm just asking serious questions. No, I appreciate questions. the challenge. Yeah. Well, I understand. I, I, I don't think that you really understand what I'm talking about when it comes to non-linguistic elements. And, and this is not a show that we need to go a to Z with that, but I, I, I uh -huh. would like for you to uh, do some homework on that. I, I think that it would, you're a very objective young man. I, I can't say anything, but uh, wow. I mean, you I have really wowed too, me tonight. For I, I an think apologist, that, um, yeah, to be uh, honest with you, because most, um, that's one thing I admire about Adam. It sounds like he's doing a lot of studies. He exactly. possibly, hopefully, is rethinking hell. Um, I don't know that I'm, I'm making a presumption, but most apologists or some apologists will stick with something uh, and be a parrot. And it doesn't sound like Adam is that way. And so I have a lot of respect for that yeah. to be very objective. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, you've been. Yeah, I definitely have changed my view, Phil. Uh, I, I want to make that clear. I, I don't believe in the eternal torment understanding. I, I just, scripturally, I don't think it's even tenable. Uh, most theists are not capable of being able to talk like you are tonight, especially when being in question. And I have questioned several of your uh, of your points, and yet you uh -huh. you you have stayed kind and patient. And um, I'm asking this question: What uh, what is your reason for doing so? Because I really applaud that. I love that about you. Uh, multiple reasons, I guess. I, I don't, I don't like to. Um, when it, uh, one, I guess a positive one. A positive one is the fact that I do like having things that I believe challenged. Um, any sort of frustration would be something like I'm either not understanding what the thing is, or we just keep butting heads on. Be saying yes, it is. No, it isn't. You know, you saying no, it isn't, or, or something like that. So if there was any fr frustration, it would probably be more in the sense of that. But yeah, positively, I absolutely love having my beliefs challenged. I, I think that my, my number one desire is to know truth. Um, another part of the sort of negative thing is I don't like to be rude. <laughs> um, I, I, I just don't think that it's nice, <laughs> I guess. Uh, I, I guess those would be the two. Yeah, that 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 has been a wild. Well, that's point. another difference between him and and uh, some apologists. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you don't like to it, be. It really rude. is um, overbearing, and, and Christopher has been very patient because it's not that uh, we've gone to him a lot, but the things that he has said, especially about not forcing or or trying to evangelize people to become atheists, I think that's a good viewpoint. Um, you know, I wish more Christians were that way. Uh, early on in the discussion, and we never did follow it through, uh, you were interested in Adam's philosophy. And uh, could you continue that conversation just a little bit longer for us, Christopher? Well, sure. Um, uh, so you had mentioned, Adam, that you, were, uh, that you found a couple of... Uh, See, it's, it's very difficult to follow up because Adam is so respectful and nice and, and, mm -hmm. and forgiving about his position. He's just like, yeah, these things are kind of, you know, uh, I find them convincing, but they're not objectively convincing. So, you know, so following up on them is just like, oh, okay, well, you know, if you find them convincing for you, then have at it. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's very difficult to follow up on them because it's just like, you know, it was kind of uh -huh. like uh, I was trying to take his temperature on it. And, you know, he very graciously was just like, yeah, that's, that's my temperature, but it's not everyone's temperature. So, so I think, um, how, how do you follow up with that? <laughs> right. Well, I think you mentioned uh, one of them was um, miracles and the uh, um, efficacy of prayer. Um, yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I had a question about how he squares um, his faith with science. And right. that was one of the examples that I brought up. Right. Um, so, faith in um, science? Go ahead. And like, do you believe in evolution? 
Yeah, I was curious about what is how his faith bumps up against science. My faith and science, how they how they come together. I don't yes. really, to be honest, I don't see a dichotomy there where like I have one part of my brain that well, this is the I believe in science part, and then the mm -hmm. other part is I believe in faith part, and never the twain shall meet. I think that uh, it, I think that they can work together. I I, I really don't see that problem. Um, if you could probably point to a specific problem, I guess maybe I could deal with that, but I've never really understood the whole faith versus science thing. That never made sense to me. Okay. Um, are you a proponent of uh, an old Earth? Like, do you believe that the Earth is 4.5 uh, billion years old and that the universe is 16 billion years old? And, you know, do you believe the Big Bang? And do you believe that uh, abiogenesis is how life started on Earth potentially? And evolution took hold after that and all of that? Uh, yeah, I would have no problem with either the Big Bang. I actually very much endorse the Big Bang. I, I have no problem whatsoever with it. Evolution, I don't have a problem with it either. I I don't know the, the, the scientific arguments positively for it, but most scientists obviously believe it to be true, so I don't have a reason to arrogantly claim that I'm smarter than because, you know, okay. my interpretation of Genesis 1 is a historical interpretation and therefore you're wrong kind of thing. I, I don't okay. take that sort of arrogant view. And what's your position on things like intelligent design? Um, I think there's sometimes, I'm not saying you're doing this, but sometimes there's a misnomer concerning intelligent design. Uh, theistic evolution perfectly fits within intelligent design. It, intelligent design is... Uh, many forms of it is evolution guided by God to whatever extent God guides it. Um, it's not the six day creationism, that's completely different. So sometimes uh, I know a lot of atheists try to make the straw man of well, if someone believes that God created the universe however he did it, evolution, Big Bang, and all that stuff or not, you know, they therefore must be a six day creationist who believes the earth is flat or something. I just, I don't, I don't think that's fair. Yeah, that's, that's, that's painting in broad that's strokes, that's putting up a straw man argument. I totally agree with you. And, um, you yeah. know, uh, I'm also a, a little bit different as far as the atheist world goes because, um, you know, as far as what happened before the Big Bang, uh, it's a mystery. And, you know, if, if, uh, if somebody wanted to put a prime mover anywhere, if they wanted to put it there, I would be totally fine with it. Um, well, that's where, but, yeah, that's where God should be. Uh, yeah. Adam, let me ask you a couple of theological questions just before we end the show. We have just about five minutes left. Um, All right. Do you think that God is actually love? I believe that God is love, yes. I believe that um, I can get into some depth with that, but I, I don't know how, how far I can get into with it. But, yeah, I believe God is love. Do you think that Paul was writing, that is, if some translation models are correct, do you think that Paul was right in stating that love is patient, kind, and doesn't even keep a record of wrongs? Yeah, I believe that's true. So if God didn't keep a record of wrongs because he's love, what was the purpose of the death of Christ? Um, that is the perfect example of love because what we're talking about is not in a conflicting sense but in the sense of god has justice as well and so rather than put the uh the wrongs of our sin, uh, 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 of our sins on an account and kind of send us to hell for that in that sense um or annihilate us more specifically um rather than that he placed it on himself god did so that is the that's the perfect expression of love Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But the, the question would remain if you never had an account or kept a record against anyone, what would be placed upon Christ if actually, in fact, God did love us in that kind of way? It seems like Paul is talking about unconditional love and acceptance, or am I misreading that? Um, I would say that with the death and resurrection of Christ, Christ is what's called the firstborn of all creation in the sense that he is the beginning of a new creation. Um, and I don't know if you're, if you know the different 
sorts of uh, views of the atonement, I would follow what's called the Christus Victor right. model, where where what happens is Jesus conquered death, and so through his death and resurrection, creation is being renewed. And it's our task to renew that creation, to um, get rid of the corruption. It's not so much just the, well, you know, I've got this, you know, God's saying, I've got this paper that has, you know, all these sins that you've done. It's the actual effect of sin. That's the problem. Not the, well, I have a, a, this legal, you know, I'm suing, God is suing us kind of thing. And he's going to take every penny from us that he can. It's, sin does have an effect on us, on ourselves. So that's the problem that needs to be dealt with. So Not the, the record itself. And, you know, the Christus Victor uh, argument is much variegated, and since it is, I, I just want to question it just for a moment. Uh, do you think that it was necessary to have Jesus beaten beyond recognition and tortured to death to accomplish what you're suggesting? That's a bit speculative, I guess. Um, I think the important part is the, the death itself and the resurrection, um, as far as the crucifixion itself is concerned. Now, a larger part of the, the Christus Victor um, is the, the birth and the life of Christ himself as well. That's part of the atonement, or I'm not, of the renewal of, of creation. Because with this, the teachings and the uh, example that he's given us, that's a part of that renewal. Well, would it be fair to say that you do believe in some sort of a human sacrifice? I'm sorry, say again? Um, would it be fair to say that you believe in some sort of a human sacrifice? Uh, yeah, the same way in the sense that I believe that a soldier sacrifices himself, you know, for, say, you know, a village or whatever, you know, in that sense. So, in other words, you're suggesting that there would have been no other way uh, for God to deal with us without without dying in a sense. Is that correct? I don't know. I really don't know. I, I like that Sorry. answer. <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's fair enough. <laughs> That's one of the best answers I've heard in a long time. In fact, when I hear people say, I don't know, I, I have a lot of respect for them because people who claim to know everything uh, really disappoint me. Uh, Adam, it's been well, I know one... Everything, everything, I know everything other than that, you know. Okay. <laughs> hey, it's been wonderful having you on our show. You've been a delight. Would you come back? Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're a very interesting I, I young it. man. I, I, I'll be honest with you. You know a lot more than what I thought you knew before the program, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. I think that uh, you wrestle with theology well. I'm very impressed with that. Uh, I can't applaud you enough. And, and, and the, uh, the content that, Christopher, that you have given uh, tonight has been wonderful. You've been uh, very respectful and, and willing to listen to a theist and, and you know, accept, you know, what he has to say. And, and, and you're not trying to convert anyone. Mm -hmm. I, I respect that. I love that about you. Yeah, and we hope to see you on the, at the Google Hangout Wednesday. Yeah. And of course. You, yeah, you offer so much there. When are you going to make another video of your bass playing? I, I have to ask that. <laughs> as soon as possible. Well, that would be wonderful. Well, somebody said that uh, your bass playing is probably second only to your red gravy and sausage. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's true. It's true. I know how to cook. Italian American. I mean, come on now. <laughs> what What are your final thoughts, Christopher? My final thoughts? Yes. Um, I had a fantastic time uh, sitting and listening to you uh, discuss uh, with Adam. I had a fantastic time discussing with you and Adam. Uh, I hope that uh, you know everyone has a fantastic rest of the evening. I look forward to more discussions. And uh, Adam, I'm going to friend you up on Facebook and hope that we can continue discussing things uh, offline. Or online. Oh, yeah, sure thing. Offline, mm -hmm. offline yeah, online. from the show, but mm -hmm. online, online. That's wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ad, Adam, what are your final thoughts? Um, yeah, this is a very good discussion. I always like being challenged. And uh, definitely want to look up the uh, non-linguistic part because that's something I have not really encountered, at least insofar as I understand what you're saying. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. So I want to look into what, what you're saying. Would you be able to give me some, uh, I guess, links on my Facebook about that privately? Yeah, we, um, we, we can do so privately on, on the phone because, yeah. you know, I, I, I really think that, 
we we have to admit I, I don't think that we have all the linguistic and the non-linguistic elements it's not just the non-linguistic it's that's not the top issue here I mean there are so many things that we don't have and and I have a list a mile long and some and lots of questions and so uh, this is going to be fun and and like Christopher said you know uh, from here on out let's just stay connected somehow and I'd love for you to be a part of the New Covenant group because we're theists and atheists alike just simply coming together, learning to wrestle with ideas, mm -hmm. not just the Bible, but with science and everything else that uh -huh. matters. Because Moral dilemmas. Yeah. Uh, we we know, like the sense of community here. It's wonderful. Right. We have atheists and theists alike in the, in the audience here in the studio, and they have been so patient uh, with us tonight, and we thank you guys for coming tonight. What were you going to say? I was going to say well, one of the uh, comments that Bob Graves made um, is, as far as non-linguistic elements, is you know some of the things that Jesus said, it they could have been driven with sarcasm. You know, we we just don't know, and so far removed, you know, from the situation, uh, it's hard to tell. In, a, in other words, it was like when he said, you know, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel when this lady is begging for help for her daughter is he saying that as a sarcasm to his disciples who could care less about anyone outside of the concept of of, of Israel and and this is this these are things that we need to know for for sure and, and we may not ever know but you know it it takes uh, you know understanding you know I, I I would lean more towards saying that Jesus was saying this as a sarcasm like Bob would uh, simply because I'm, I, I'm more convinced that he is loving and kind. But I have to be honest, I don't have the proof that is non-linguistically speaking or even linguistically speaking to, to have some form of certitude there, if that makes sense. Mm. And so, okay, but uh, let's get into more discussions like this offline, online, whatever, and on this show. Uh, it's been wonderful having all of you guys here. And I think that Joey wants to say something in the back. And so I think that our program is just about over. What say you, Joey? Thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, I'm always, always struggling for the spotlight. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a wonderful evening here again at The Place, and I don't mind saying that these have been two of our best guests uh, on this show. And uh, join us every week. Uh, we'll be back again Wednesday at, uh, at 7 o'clock with the Unconventional Pastor, and after that with the Cult of Honesty, in which you can join us on Google Hangouts. And then again Sunday all day long from 10 to 10. We'll be doing this all over again, ending with uh, these exciting discussions and building up uh, to it all day long. Uh, get involved in the New Covenant group. Get involved in the conversation. Join us on Facebook, friend Kaine uh, Gosh, if I could only tell you how to spell that, uh, I don't know. Uh, friend, fr uh, yeah, the New Covenant group. Search for the New Covenant group. Thank you. Um, and um, find out how you can get involved. There's all sorts of ways that you can let your voice be heard. Until then, we'll see you next week, and we love you.